So today we are going to start a lecture on penalty and barrier methods. And this continues some of our discussion on unconstrained as well as constrained optimization. So in these methods, we are going to convert a constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained optimization problem. And then we can use the plethora of methods discussed before to solve these problems. So this is lecture 33 and I'm Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Now we are going to look at nonlinear constraint optimization problems. So in the last few lectures, we looked at the linear programming problem, which are essentially linear constraint optimization problems because linear programming does require that you have a fully defined constraint set. Now, some of the simplest methods which we can come up with to solve constraint optimization problems are the penalty and barrier methods. And these methods basically convert a constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained optimization problem. So philosophically speaking, this is the simplest approach you can think of, is that if you can do something to the objective function and constraint, such that you can convert the complicated constraint problem to an unconstrained problem. Now, there are two different approaches to solving this constraint optimization problem. The penalty method tries to impose a penalty for violating a constraint. Whereas the barrier method puts a barrier around the feasible region and in the barrier method, you stay inside this feasible region and you do not go out into the infeasible region. So these two different approaches are there and we will see based on these two type of thinking patterns, we get two different methods. Now, before delving into each of these methods separately, let us look at it in a general form. So essentially, let's start with the constraint optimization problem where you want to minimize some function f of x. And now, because you are in a constraint problem, your x will lie inside a feasible region given by this set S. So this set S is the set of points which satisfies the constraints of the problem. So what you could do is that you could define a function sigma and this sigma function would have a value zero whenever you are inside the feasible region, that is whenever your constraints are satisfied. And this function would have infinite value when you are outside the feasible region, that is when x is not inside this S set. So this particular simply defined function would essentially impose an infinite penalty for violating feasibility. And then if we add f to sigma, we could create a new function and the constraint optimization problem would then be transformed into an unconstrained optimization problem. So essentially, we could create a function f of x plus sigma of x, where sigma would be zero inside the feasible region and it would become infinite outside the feasible region. So this is the basic philosophy behind this kind of penalty and barrier method. Now, of course, this approach is not practical for many situations because we see that sigma x is not defined outside the feasible region because it is simply blowing up to infinite value. Now, you could replace sigma x with a large positive number, and this is sometimes done in situations where you are doing stochastic optimization and so on. But still, the unconstrained optimization problem would get complicated because there would be a sharp discontinuity at the boundary of S. So you are suddenly going to go from zero when you are inside the feasible region to infinite value when you cross the feasible region. So if you are using gradient based methods, this is not something which is going to work out well because you're going to have discontinuities at this boundary. And so all your derivative information is going to get 
impacted negatively. So again, what we try to do is we try to uh, smooth out this particular function such that this discontinu discontinuity at the feasible region is somewhat mitigated. So barrier and penalty methods, they try to create a sequence of unconstrained subproblems. And the penalty function sigma x is replaced by a continuous function which sequentially goes to sigma x. So when you first start your process, it is not so nonlinear or discontinuous, but as you get closer to the optimal solution, you sequentially create this particular barrier or high level of penalty for violating the constraints. Now, in barrier methods, a barrier function is used, which essentially reaches this function sigma x from inside the feasible region or from the interior of the feasible region. So barrier methods are also sometimes known as interior point methods because they are navigating from inside the feasible region toward the optimal point, which typically will lie at the boundary of the feasible region. Now, if you have constructed an optimization problem well, your optimum point should lie at the boundary of the feasible region because the constraints should be coming into force at one of those points. So barrier methods create a barrier or wall around the feasible region, which prevents the design variables from reaching the boundary. So you could think of it as a castle with a surrounding wall and essentially you are forced to stay inside this castle because you cannot get out of this particular situation. So essentially barrier methods also impose this wall around the feasible region. Whereas in penalty methods, the penalty function reaches sigma x from the exterior of the feasible region. Therefore, penalty methods are also known as exterior point methods. Penalty functions act as a penalty for the point being infeasible. So essentially, if you are inside the feasible region, there is no penalty. And if you are outside the feasible region, you are penalized for this particular transgression or trespassing which you have done by going outside the feasible region. Both these Barrier and penalty methods are classified as a type of method known as SUMT, S-U-M-T, which essentially means sequential unconstrained minimization techniques. And we will see why the name sequential comes because the particular penalty functions are built up slowly using a particular penalty parameter R. So let's now give this problem a more quantitative feel Recall that the constraint optimization problem was minimize function f of x subject to constraints hx equal to zero and gx less than equal to zero. So this was our constraint optimization problem which we have solved using the KKT conditions in some of the first few lectures. So now what we do is we create a transformation function which combines f of x, h of x, and g of x in this manner. So this transformation function, which we will call as phi, is a function of x and r. And here r is a scalar penalty parameter, which is basically a number. It can be 1, 10, 1000, 10,000, something like that. Now p is a penalty function, and we will discuss more about this later. Now the first thing you can see here is that the penalty function should be non-negative. So it should basically penalize this function. So if you are trying to minimize the function phi of x, essentially you are also trying to minimize the function f of x, then this p should be a penalty. So it should uh, act to increase f of x. So that is the primary role of this penalty here. Now this Penalty function P of X should be zero if you are inside the feasible region. Therefore, if the constraints are satisfied, then this function would be zero and you are essentially then solving an unconstrained optimization problem. 
However, in case you are outside the feasible region, then this particular value will become a large value and therefore your method will try to get you out of this region and into the feasible region. So it will push you from the infeasible region to the feasible region. Now let us see a popular penalty function. So we could create a function such as this. So here R is your penalty parameter and here we are simply taking the square norms of H and G. So again here GI plus is defined as the maximum value of either zero or GIX. Now recall that if GIX is negative, then you are in the feasible region. So when GI becomes greater than or equal to zero, you are out of the feasible region and therefore then this thing is becoming active or it is having some positive value. So basically whenever your constraints are violated, this is going to be some positive number. And if your constraints are satisfied, then this whole penalty is going to be zero. Now you control the size of this number using this value R here, which we will see can be slowly made larger to become more and more of a penalty to the objective function. So there are two possible cases we can consider here. One is that GIX equal to zero when your constraint is not active or it is just uh, at the boundary of the feasible region, but it is greater than zero if you have violated your feasible region. So in that case, this GIX will start to show up in the penalty function. So of course you can see that this is a penalty and therefore if you are out of the feasible region, you are penalized. So we see that if the constraints are not satisfied, which means they are violated, then Px has a positive value. And the unconstrained minimization of Fx plus Px can be used to solve the constraint optimization problem. And the starting point in the penalty method can be whatever given point of x you take. It can be in the feasible region. It can be outside the feasible region. Now, typically, if you just come up with the value of x, it is very likely that it may not satisfy the constraints and therefore it is likely to be an infeasible design point. And therefore, the penalty method in general would move from the infeasible region into the feasible region. And therefore, these are called exterior point methods because they are coming from the exterior boundary of the feasible region. Now, in general, penalty methods are more suited to equality constraint problems. You could uh, use the penalty methods for the inequality constraint problems, but sometimes you may encounter issues with second derivatives becoming discontinuous where some of these constraints become active. And if you are using any method based on a Newton method, you can be pretty unsafe near some of these boundary points because the second derivative matrices such as uh, the H matrix can become ill-conditioned. Now we can start looking at some of the problems which you can have with the penalty method. Firstly, we saw that you are going through the infeasible region and therefore for some reason if your method crashes or terminates at some point, then the particular value of x you have at that point, which is the design, may not be a feasible design. So it would be an infeasible design and you may not be able to use it in any practical setting. Now, the infeasible design sometimes may not be calculable for some engineering problems due to physics. So we have encountered this situation in some research problems with the flutter based design, where if you are trying to design a wing, and you are out in the flutter region, your code may actually not converge and give you a solution because you are too far out into a region where the particular vehicle may not survive or may not be able to fly and the physics which has been used to develop the model may not work. So one of the things you should do whenever you use methods which uh, go into the infeasible region is that you should make sure that the design variables are such that your model remains valid. 
So you may want to put some constraints on the physical variables themselves, such as if you are dealing with slenderness of beams or structural deflections, then these must be constrained to some low value such that your model remains valid and it is in the feasible region. You also need to check if the mathematical theory you are using is valid in some of the regions where the optimizer is taking you because the, as far as the optimizer is concerned it is a purely mathematical model or mathematical way of thinking and it can take your problem into regions where the theory you have developed which may be based on some linear method may not be valid. For example if your deflections of a mechanical system become too large then again the linear theory is not valid and so you need to be careful about such situations. Now there are also some peculiar functions uh, where you do not need to repeat the process of penalty functions continuously by changing the penalty parameter r and these are sometimes known as exact penalty functions. And here we don't need to consider a sequence of unconstrained optimization problems. Instead, we can use this exact penalty function just once. So an example of such an exact penalty function is given here. And here you can see this particular function uses some absolute values instead of the norm. And therefore, again, here you take the value of h, take the absolute value, and similarly, the constraint, if it's violated, you take the absolute value of this. So this is the penalty term. And again, the penalty term will be there if you are violating the constraints. So this kind of method is useful in many situations, and you can use a large value of R, such as 1,000 or 10,000, and you can solve this problem. Now, if we choose a large value of R, minimizing the function will also solve the constraint optimization problem. And then you don't need to solve a series of unconstrained optimization problems. So basically, we see that in the kind of penalty method, which is using exact penalty functions, your function may be continuous but not differentiable at all, at all points. But this would restrict gradient-based methods which require you to calculate the gradient matrix, the H matrix, and so on, especially the Newton method. But these methods become very effective when you use stochastic optimization methods which essentially do not require gradient-based calculations such as the genetic algorithm, particle swarm optimization, and so on. So in many cases nowadays people use some of those methods and in those cases penalty methods can be very useful. So you can use a penalty with a large value of R such as 10,000 or more or you can use some of these exact penalty functions which we have propounded in some of the previous slide. And uh, if you are using stochastic methods, you can almost use that function sigma x, which was becoming very large when you encountered the infeasible region. So very often a very large value is put there. And if you get out of the feasible region, then essentially you are terminated. So that can sometimes be done in a harsh penalty. So again, this was an introduction to the penalty and barrier method. And in the next lecture, I'm going to go in detail into the barrier method. And then we are going to write it out as a series of steps which could be used to write a computer program for these methods. So again, I will see you in my next video where we are going to discuss the barrier function in more detail.